But for today's conversation, we're going to look at four expectations that the Bible writer and the Bible, you know, I guess God expects us as Christians to practice in our life as we as we wait or as we expect eternity to arrive. And so the letters of First Thessalonians, let me just kind of give up. When we read the Bible, you know, we know that in the days following Jesus' time here on earth, the early church began to grow. And one of the ways that the early church Christians would stay connected with each other as they, as they moved out of Jerusalem, which was really sort of the hub, the hub of what, where Christianity started with Jesus' ministry, as they began to spread across the country, these early church leaders, like the Apostle Paul, would write letters to these various pockets of, of small groups that were, you know, venturing out. And First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians, which we're reading right now, is one of those letters. Most of the New Testament portion, there's 27 books in the New Testament of our Bible, and much of it are letters that have been written to, like Palm Harvest Church, hey, I want you to be, be reminded of this. And so when we read these letters, this, uh, the, the book of 1 Thessalonians is, is written to, it's a letter written to a group of Christians who are living in the region of northern Greece, also known as Macedonia. It's where, uh, an area where Alexander the Great, the great, you know, commander in chief and world conqueror came from. That's the region that he grew up with. And in that region was a small group of Christians who, the, who, the Apostle Paul is writing to, and they're waiting, they're expecting for Jesus to come back because Jesus, you remember, said, I'm going to go to heaven, I'm going to get it ready, I'm going to come back and get you. And so one year goes by, two years go by, three years goes by, and people are starting to feel a little restless, like, when's he going to come back? When's he going to come back? And Paul's like saying, he's coming back at the same time, and in the meantime, you got to keep living. And so Today's conversation, I've titled it Pre-Heaven Living Instructions. Pre-Heaven Living Instructions. And we're going to start reading at verse 10 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And so if you have a Bible, whether it's in paper or digital form, follow along as I read or we'll have the verses on the screen in front of you. This is what we're told. Christ died for us so that whether we're dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are doing. Let me stop here for a second and write this down, point number one, in your app notes. You know, brothers and sisters, hope we don't get water on this. That's all right. As followers of Jesus, we are told here to love each other. Love each other. You know, one of, pre, one of the pre-eternity, pre-heaven living instructions that God our Creator wants us to live out until His Son Jesus returns to take us home to heaven is to love each other. Paul says here to, to look after each other, to encourage and, and build each other up, much like Beto just did in, in his prayer, right, together where we're praying for each other. So how do we do that? Well, he answers that question in verse 14. So skip forward to verse 14, and this is what he says. He says, brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy. Encourage those who are timid. Take tender care of those who are weak and be patient with most people. Is that what he says? Be patient with who? With everyone. Well, that's hard, hard teaching. See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. So what's Paul saying? Well, in Mike Decker's uh, words, I propose he's saying this. Letter A in your notes. Be generous with your compliments and stingy with your criticism. Be generous with your compliments and stingy with your criticism. And then letter B, indiscriminately turn the other cheek or turn your cheek indiscriminately turn your cheek. So be generous with your compliments, not your criticism. Be stingy with your criticism. And then letter B, he says, indiscriminately turn your cheek. You know, the, Paul writes, be patient with everyone, right? See that no one pays back evil for evil. I don't know if you would agree with me uh, 
with this on this particular point or not, but I, it's my, my conviction that one of the sort of the distinguishing markers of a Christ follower, of someone who is a Jesus follower, is that she or he will intentionally overlook wrongs. Is that hard for some of you to do? You know, friends, I propose that to offer someone forgiveness instead of retaliation when they hurt us with their words or their actions is a volitional choice, right? Would you agree with that? So show of hands, complete honesty now. How many of you have it hard to offer somebody kindness when they're nasty? Anybody? Okay, I, I confess that's, I agree with many of you. Because loving someone toward, when they've been hurtful toward us or toward those who love us, it's not our natural inclination, is it? That being said, I have learned in my life, and maybe you have as well, that with God's help, loving people is a possibility. You know, I was really struck by Beto's prayer here just earlier where he, he said, Lord, you know, how cool would that be to see my enemies in heaven? I never really thought about that before. You know, that, that, that our enemies actually give their hearts to Jesus and, and maybe they're saying that same thing about us. When we get there, they go, well, I, never, I never thought you would be here. Hopefully not. I think, I propose that when you and I extend grace, someone grace instead of our fist, that that's an indicator that God's at work in our life. Would you agree with that? You know, when our words are complimentary and, and not critical, no matter what someone might say or no matter how right we might be, I see that as an indicator of God's work in our life. You know, I suspect that most of you know that during the days of old, in the pre-Jesus days, the Bible taught that if, you, if someone hurt you, physically, that you had the right to retaliate, right? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Have you all heard that phrase? That was, that was part of the Bible. But then when Jesus arrived on the scene, he, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to look at these verses here, he started to teach something completely different. Do you remember what he taught? Go to Matthew chapter 5 if you have your Bible open, and uh, skip down to verse 38. Let's just read three verses. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, and this is what Jesus taught about this whole retaliation piece. He says, you've heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other cheek also, verse 41, if a soldier demands that you carry his gear for one mile, carry it two miles. So what's the translation here? Well, the translation is that as Jesus followers, we're to go the extra mile with people, aren't we? We're to give more than what is expected. And when we sandwich together what Jesus taught with what Paul wrote here, the Apostle Paul wrote here to the Thessalonica Christians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, one of our kingdom responsibilities as Jesus' followers, as we wait for Christ's return actively, is to love each other is to serve one another sacrificially with rolled up sleeves. And I know that many of you are doing that. You know, I shared on the first week of our series how one of the distinguishing markers of this, this group of Christians living in Thessalonica is that they had a reputation for being a, a church community that loved their neighbors. And I, would, and I shared how it's my conviction that that's true for us too. In fact, I often hear about when Palm Harvest Church is involved with, with, in the community, people know us to be a group of people who love Jesus and love each other with rolled up sleeves. And I say, well done, Palm Harvest. Good job. And that's simply a, a mandate that God gives us. But here's a deeper question for you to kind of evaluate yourself with. And only you can really answer this question is that when you serve... When you're out in the community and you're, you know, loving your neighbor, whatever that looks like in your various circles, when you serve, are you encouraging with your words or are you critical? You know, do you serve with a cheerful heart or are you critical of the people who maybe you're serving alongside? Why don't they do this, right? It's easy to do. We're there with the right motives and yet when we look a little bit deeper and we pull off the mask, so to speak, our hearts 
maybe aren't as cheerful and God-loving as, as maybe we want to pretend to be. And so I want us to pray a, a prayer together. Maybe we could call it the grumpy, not, no, the anti-grumpy prayer. We're going to say a prayer together. And in this conversation, I, ask, I want us to, I want you to join me in asking God, our Heavenly Father, to increase our capacity to serve others in Christ, until Christ comes back with, a, with positivity. Are you down for that? Okay, so put everything down if you can. Put the, open the palms of your hands just as a, a symbolic gesture to God that you're, you're coming to him with an open heart. Take a deep breath. Inhale. Exhale. Now pray this. Say, Jesus, please help me to be generous with my compliments and stingy with my criticism. Please help me to indiscriminately offer forgiveness instead of retaliation. Because in my own strength, God, I won't do it. I need your help. One more prayer. Say, please increase my Christian capacity to love others. Deep breath in. Exhale. Good. Point number two. A second thing that the Apostle Paul, we're going to read here in a moment, is going to tell us to practice, or he's telling these Thessalonica Christians to practice, which applies to you and me, until we wait Christ's return, or as we await Christ's return, is to love your pastor. Now, don't shoot the messenger. That's what he says. Love your pastor, okay? Look at what Paul writes in verse 12. Dear brothers and sisters, Paul writes, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It kind of feels somewhat self-promotional, but... Uh, I won't always be your lead pastor here. Somebody else will be someday. And so if you're still around during those days, we need to practice that. But I think one of the things that this church does well is that they, they love their pastor. The fact that I've been here for 25 years, uh, I wouldn't be here probably if, if you guys were overly mean to me. And so I don't, maybe don't really need to talk about this, but Paul writes, honor those who are leaders in the Lord's work and show them Great respect. So what does that look like practically? Well, have you ever thought about that? Let me give you a couple personal anecdotal suggestions about what it means to love your pastor. For starters, I would suggest give your pastor the benefit of the doubt. Extend grace liberally. When you do that, you are loving your pastor. You know, one of the challenges of being a pastor in this ministry calling is that it is not a nine to five, eight hours a day kind of job with your weekends off. Rather, it's a 24-7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week kind of career. Even when I take a day off, I'm still not really off. And even when I go away on vacation, I'm still not really on vacation. Because if something happens to you, I'm probably coming back. It's not uncommon for me to even be on my motorcycle trip and I'll be getting these text messages from people who know I'm on vacation, but they still, they need a pastor. That's just part of, part of being a pastor. Now, I can't speak for every pastor who, who is involved in vocational ministry, but from my personal vantage point, it's, there's rarely a moment, day or night, that I'm not thinking about one of you in our church family. As you go through things, or sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night, like I this, this morning at 4 o'clock in the morning, some, I woke up with someone's name on my mind, and so instantly I start praying, Lord, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why you put them on my mind. And, and, you, and it maybe happens to you too, too. But that just goes with the calling. And so one of the ways you can love your pastor is to pray for him and pray for his wife, even as they pray for you. You know, most of you have high expectations for your pastor, and you should. That being said, your pastors are human. And they 
put their pants on one leg at a time, just like you do. And so one of the ways that you can love your pastor is to give him space and permission to take his pastor hat off once in a while, to lay his pastor backpack down a little bit, give him some grace when he's working through some, some issues that maybe he hasn't really formulated all that much, and just let him be him. You know, I, will, I walk on Tuesday mornings uh, with, with Mike Vargas and Steve Mensker and Rick Capco, and inevitably we'll talk about stuff, and every once in a while these issues will come up, and the guys are like, I'm not there just walking. I want to just go and walk. I just want to go and exercise, but suddenly I feel like I have to wear my pastor hat. I have to be on guard because I might say something that gets these guys upset. It, it has happened, and, and, and I've said to Kirk over the years of my life, Kirk, I just need my friend right now. And Kirk's been really good, like, okay, takes his, takes his boss half off, off, and he sets it aside, and he says, okay, now I'm ready. I'm ready to be present with you and allow you just to, be, just to be human a little bit. That's how you can love your pastor. And you guys do that well. You give me lots of time to ride my motorcycle, so thank you for that. You know, not too long ago, I, I, I got a phone call from a, it's been a couple years now, Full disclosures. 2021, I looked at the date of my, my text strand. 2021, so three years ago, I got a phone call from a friend of mine who's the chairman of the board at his church. And he said, Mike, uh, our pastor has asked us for a sabbatical. If you know that term sabbatical, many churches give their churches, their pastors a sabbatical, which is a time over and above their, their vacation. Uh, many churches will do that after a pastor served for eight years or so. It's kind of standard practice in, in most churches. This pastor, ha however, had only been at his church for five years. And so he was coming to his board saying, I, I, I need some time off. I'd like some time off. Can I have it? And my buddy called me and he said, Mike, uh, I'm kind of struggling with whether or not we should allow him to have this sabbatical. Which really surprised me because when Robin and I were in seminary, and he's older than I am, he and his wife were incredibly uh, uh, generous to us and, and supportive to us. And so I, I, I said to him, why the, why the reluctance? And by the way, when people call for my opinion, I love to give it. But I said, why, why the reluctance? I said, your pastor is a good pastor. And friends, good pastors are hard to find. Do you know that? This pastor has served you well. This pastor already in five years has a tremendous uh, reputation in, the, in your community. And I live several states away and I'm already aware of his reputation. Why are you so reluctant in offering him this sabbatical? If he, need, if he needs this time off, he, he needs this time off. And I said, brother, if your pastor burns out and leaves the church... Finding a good pastor is hard to find, which my, my buddy had learned firsthand. But not only is it going to be uh, hard, finding his replacement is not going to be easy, nor is it going to be inexpensive, and you're probably going to lose a lot of people when he leaves. Would you agree with that? And so I said to him, I said, if you love your pastor, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not arguing for sabbatical, so don't hear that. But I said, if you love your pastor, give him, give him his sabbatical with no strings attached. And if he goes away and he comes back and he leaves your church, I said, let that go, but do it for the good of the kingdom. I said, but my hunch is, that he's going to come back, he's going to feel refreshed, and you're going to get a large return on your investment. And guess what happened? Their board offered him the sabbatical. He took the time off. He came back refreshed. And now their church is flourishing even more so than it was before. And to me, that's a practical example of what the Apostle Paul here says is to love your pastor. Love your pastor, Paul says to these Thessalonica Christians, until Christ returns. And that, friends, has not, has not changed. I said this already. Someday someone's going to replace me. And if you love this pastor the way that you have loved me, chances are good that they'll, they'll stay for 25 years or more. Maybe you don't want that, but it's generally a good thing. So let me say one more thing, and then I'll move on. If you don't like the pastor, if you don't like what the pastor is doing, don't criticize him. Talk to him. 
And if the pastor won't listen, or you feel like the pastor doesn't listen, the better option really is to pray for him because brothers and sisters, God's in the business of changing people's hearts. Do you agree with that? And as you pray for me, say, I wish Pastor Mike were funnier. Well, one, you can give me jokes, and two, you can pray that that would happen. I don't know. Pray for me because God will hear your prayers, okay? So pray that God nurtures your pastor's spiritual development. Pray that God increases your pastor's leadership capacity. And ask God to use you to be his encourager until Christ's return. Are you with me? Okay, so let's practice that right now. So Kirk Bauermeister is one of our church elders, which means he's part of church's, Kirk's responsibility is to make sure that we stay true to God's word and to hold your pastor accountable. So Kirk's going to come up and he's going to pray for me to ask that God will be with me as we strive to practice this biblical truth to love our pastor. Are you down for that? Okay, Kirk. Use this. Use that. Use this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. This is kind of comfortable. All right. I don't want this to be just me praying for Pastor Mike. So I want all of you to put your hand up like this. And at the end, I'm going to leave a little bit of time for you to give an arrow prayer. Where you sit, you can do it silently. You can do it out loud, whatever you feel comfortable with. It could be one of the things that I prayed for or something that you have on your own. Everybody good with that? And then whatever it is that you pray, that arrow prayer, I want you to commit to praying for Pastor Mike every day this week. Everybody good with that? Okay. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this time, and we thank you for Pastor Mike and the blessing that he's been in our lives. Lord, we know that being a pastor is, uh, and the church are more under attack than they ever have been. And as Pastor Mike has become uh, the senior pastor in the city of Costa Mesa, as, and as he uh, looks for pastors to mentor in this community, Lord, we ask you to put a hedge of protection around him, that you would keep him safe that you would fill him with the Holy Spirit and give him wisdom to pass along to these young pastors. We also ask, Lord, that you would put a hedge of protection around his marriage to Robin, that you would be intentional uh, to give him ideas on ways to build into that relationship and to continue to love Robin as you love Robin. Lord, we lift up uh, Pastor Mike as a father to Gina and Casey. Lord, we ask that he would be there, that he would be there to encourage them and support them and love them as he always has. And lastly, Lord, we lift up this work that we call Palm Harvest. We ask, Lord, again, that you would continue to fill Mike with the Holy Spirit, that he would be available and here for your, your congregants, your people as he always has been. And Lord, again, just allow him to be renewed and refreshed by these prayers today and the prayers in this coming week. So right now, Lord, we lift up these arrow prayers to you. Lord, we ask all these things in the name of Jesus and all God's people were in agreement and said, Amen. Thank you. Point number three. A third thing that the Apostle Paul tells us to practice here in 1 Thessalonians, which we're going to read, as we await Christ's return and our eternity in heaven, is to live with a thankful perspective. Live with a thankful perspective. Look at what Paul writes in verse 16. Always be joyful. Huh, let me read that again. Always be joyful. On the count of three, in unison, I want to hear you say the word always. You ready? One, two, three. Always. Always. Always be joyful. Verse 17. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. You do know don't you, that it's easier to focus on the flaws in others than it is in your, of your own. It's far easy, easier for us to be critical of other people than ourselves. You know, here on this campus, for example, let me give you an example. Here on this campus, it's not uncommon for me to get letters from our neighbors complaining about something. I don't know why they write them to me, and they don't write them to Pastor Chris. 
Pastor Chris is the senior pastor of Iglesia Harbor. They're the mothership of this campus, but for whatever reason, they're always reaching out, out to me. And one of the things that we recently got a, a letter for was the homeowners association that lives right behind uh, us on this this the neighbor the apartments were complaining because some of the trees the leaves from our trees were were falling over on their side of the fence and it was making things messy and so we want to be good neighbors and so i gave the letter to chris and rob friedman wave your hand rob rob's a board member of iglesia harbor and he's you know, he and Chris decided, well, we'll take care of the, the leaf problem. And so they prune the trees back way low to the, to the side, to the kind of the height of the fence, eliminating the leaf problem. Well, guess what the homeowners association is complaining about now? They lost their privacy because the tree leaves are gone. And now suddenly they can see the building more than they could before. There's always something that we can complain about. Friends, don't be that person. Paul writes, choose positivity until Christ comes back. Live with the thankful perspective. See the good in your pastor. See the good in your neighbor. Be thankful in all circumstances. You know, Jerry Geislin, most of you know Jerry. She's been a part of our church family for almost as long as we've been in existence. She right now has stage three colon cancer. She said that'd be okay for me to share with you. But if you talk to Jerry, you'd never know it because she's so positive. And if you were to sit down with Jerry, I don't know how many of you know Jerry's story, but she's got an amazing story. Like she was in the radio, you know, she's a big, she's a big league artist back in, in, in the Midwest and stuff before she came here. And yet at the same time, she's had some, some hard, hard life experiences. But when you talk to her, you go, how in the world can you stay so positive? How in the world can you always be focusing on, on the good and not necessarily, you know, do the whole poor me thing. Well, she would point to Jesus for certain. But it's a choice that she makes. She lives her life with this thankful perspective. And so now as she's dealing with stage three colon cancer, she just got out of the hospital this last week. Um, you, when you talk to her, she's so thankful for her doctors. And she's so thankful for the fact that her kids get to be a part and are choosing to walk with her on this, this journey. And she's empowered to have this bright outlook because of her relationship with Jesus. Now, is she concerned? Oh, for sure she's sure concerned. I mean, stage three colon cancer is no, nothing, you know, to sneeze about, I guess. And yet at the same time, she's not going to let it get her down. Now, we need to pray for Jerry, and I hope you'll start to even now if you're not already. But brothers and sisters, the, the personal question for you to ask yourself today is, are you positive? Are you choosing positivity over negativity? Because it's a choice. We all have the same choice. It doesn't mean we deny stuff. It doesn't mean that we don't feel the hurt and the pain and the struggle and maybe sometimes get mad. It's just that do you choose positivity? That's what the Apostle Paul is asking us here. When life surprises you, do you get mad at God or do you choose to trust him? and live with a thankful perspective. And so what are you thankful for today? Just take an inventory right now. Just go through the list of, of things in your mind. Like, hmm, if I had to make a list of things that I'm thankful for today, it would be this. Yeah, my son is really giving me grief right now, but at least he's still alive. I'd take that over the other option, right? Yes, I got problems at work, but at least I got a job and an income coming in. So at least I'm going to focus on that. So even the, the, the tough stuff that maybe some of you are, are, are dealing with in your life right now, can you be thankful? Can you take a list of things that you're thankful for? Okay, so let's say a prayer of thankfulness right now. Let's say a prayer of thankfulness. So put everything down. Put your palms open because, again, we're saying, God, I, I want to choose to be thankful, and I can't do this on my own. I need your help. I need your strength. I need your perspective. I need your empowering. So take a deep breath. Everybody breathe in. 
Hold it. Feel the tension build up in your lungs. Exhale. Good. One more breath. Easy breath in. Easy exhale out. Now say this. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for, and you fill in the blank. It could be your family. It could be your friends. It could be your health. It could be your work. It could be your church family. It could have been the breakfast you had this morning, the coffee. What? Thank you, God, for. There's nothing too small or too big that we can't have a thankful perspective on. Now let's thank God in advance for the work that he's going to do in Jerry's life right now as she battles this cancer. So with a thankful perspective, say, thank you, God, that you're going to do this for Jerry physically and, and emotionally. You feel in the blank. What do you want God to do for Jerry right now in this moment? And thank him that he's going to do it in faith. Deep breath in, exhale, good. All right, point number four. And we're going to land the plane really quickly on this one. The final word of instruction that the Apostle Paul offers to all of us who are Christians as we await Christ's return is to use the Bible to discern truth, okay? Point number four, use the Bible to discern truth. Let's read a couple more verses and then we'll be done. Verse 19, this is what he ends. He says, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. So do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. You know, as we move deeper into this eternity conversation, as we start to look at sort of eschatology, which is basically a theological term for the study of end times, as we start talking about what's going to take place when Christ comes back, full disclosure, it's going to be a little confusing at times. Like I might even feel a little contradictory. The church has fought over some of these things for centuries. And so to navigate and to discern truth from falsehood, it's always good to ask the question, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Which by the fact that you're here today, we're tuning in online today, you are practicing. So well done. So as we start to move through this conversation about eternity, so now Paul has just set everybody up and as we move into 2 Thessalonians, he's going to start talking about some of these things that are going to take place when Christ comes back. And there's going to be people and there's going to be Antichrist and there's going to be floods and there's going to be all these things. We've got to always come back to this basic question, what does the Bible say? Because as we do that, as you get in the question of asking at the habit of asking that question, you will continue to mature as a Christian until Christ calls you home, okay? So enough on that. Let's close in prayer. And as we go to prayer, let me review these four pre-heaven living instructions. So just close your eyes for a second. Just get in a posture of prayer. And I want you to think in your mind, of these four things, which one do I want help in growing in the most? Okay, do I need help in loving each other? Do I need help in loving my pastor? Do I need God's help in helping me to live with a thankful perspective? Or do I need God's help to help me to answer, ask the question and to use the Bible to, to discern truth, okay? Which one would you like God's help to do better? Everybody got something? Okay, take a deep breath in. Exhale. Now in your heart and in your mind, pray this, say, God, as I bring this conversation to a close and I review these four things, please help me do better this week. And then you fill in the blank. Which one? Love your neighbor, love your pastor, live with a thankful perspective, or just use the Bible more quickly to discern truth. God, please help me to do this better. This is my prayer, my eternity, my pre-eternity prayer today. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.